On February 24th, 2019, a woman arrived at a ceramics factory in Hubei province in China. She walked through the front door into the main office where she saw a desk attendant. She informed them she was a quality control inspector and she was there that day to inspect their vehicles. The attendant was accustomed to their company being periodically inspected. And so she asked the woman if she needed any help and the woman said, nope, I'm just gonna roam around your building, check what I need to check and then I'll be out of here. And so the attendant told her that was totally fine. And if she needed anything, just come back and she would help her. And so the inspector thanked her and then turned around and went out the front door and checked the vehicles in the front lot of the ceramics factory and then after she was done she went back into the main office she walked past the attendant and out the back door into the very active yard where all day long these huge bulldozers would move around thousands of pounds of sand and so the inspector walked out that back door and she scanned the yard and she saw there were two bulldozers doing just that moving all around and then off to the left side there was a dump truck that seemed to be stationary and so very confidently she just walked right into the yard and made her way over to that dump truck. And then when she got there, she flagged the driver down and said she was an inspector and that she was gonna check the vehicle out. And so the driver helped her by turning on and off signals and moving back and forth. And then at some point, the inspector needed the dump truck driver to back up a significant distance. She needed to watch him do that. And so she, the inspector, backed away from the dump truck until she was in the middle of the yard, standing right in front of this parked bulldozer. What happens next is all caught on video. And so as she's standing there and she's watching the dump truck back up right in front of her, the bulldozer driver right behind her turns on the machine and immediately lurches forward. Now, the driver of this bulldozer did not see the woman, and she was in his blind spot right in front of the bucket of his bulldozer, and he was not aware there was somebody on foot walking around the yard. It's an extremely dangerous place to be on foot. And so he goes right into her and he knocks her backwards. She falls into the bucket. She starts screaming, but no one can hear her. It's so loud. And the driver drives the bucket directly into a pile of sand and scoops up thousands of pounds of sand that come down directly on this woman. So now she's completely buried alive and being crushed by all the sand. And then the driver, completely oblivious, lifts the bucket up turns around and drives across the yard and dumps the sand and the woman into a vibrating sand crusher. The vibrating sand crusher is exactly what it sounds like. It pulverizes bits of rock and stone and grinds them down into a very fine powder. The machines come in various shapes and sizes, but this one inside of the ceramics factory was a top-loaded version, and it basically looked like a big dumpster with this big opening at the top. And so these bulldozer drivers would take these clumps of sand and they would dump it in this opening at the top of this bin. And then once they dumped their sand into the opening, the machine would vibrate, causing the sand to filter its way down towards the bottom of the machine, where there were these big, vicious metal claws that constantly smashed together and would just completely obliterate anything that passed through them. In the video, when the driver dumps his bucket load into the sand crusher, you can actually see the woman falling in, but then she immediately jumps into action and begins trying to pull herself up and out of this pile. And at some point she gets most of her upper body out and she waves and she gets the attention of the driver who's just dumped her into the sand crusher. And the driver, he stops right away. You can see the vehicle lurch to a stop. He leaps out and he starts running over to the sand crusher but as he's running over this woman who's waving and waving at some point her leg or some other part of her gets grabbed by those jaws at the bottom of the machine and she's pulled slowly down into the sand crusher and disappears under the sand when this happens the driver is frantic and he's screaming for other people in the factory to come over and help and at some point the others inside they realize there's an emergency and they all run over but when they realize what's happened that someone has fallen into the sand crusher. They all just stop and stand there because they know there's nothing they can do. The woman was gone. In June of 2015, 45-year-old James Young landed his dream job. For the last several years, James had been a fifth grade teacher in East Canton, Ohio, teaching special education. And while he loved his job and he loved the kids he worked with, he had always had his eye on becoming a guidance counselor for high school students. In 1988, James had actually graduated from East Canton, Ohio High School. And ever since his graduation, he had wanted to come back to the school and help the next generation of East Canton students prepare for their lives as adults. And a guidance counselor was designed to do just that. James had applied for the 
job before, but every time he applied, they would tell him that while he was qualified, there just wasn't a spot open for him. However, at the end of that school year, he was told a guidance counselor spot had opened up at the high school and the job was his if he wanted it. And so of course, James said, yes, I'll take the job. And immediately he told his mother about this amazing news. And his mother, who lived only a block away from him in East Canton, Ohio, would say that her son was so ecstatic about the job that normally when summer break was coming up, he would really look forward to that time off from school. But now that he had this new job to look forward to, he was already anxious for the summer to be over. James was a single man, but he was not lonely. He had a number of very close lifelong friends that he would spend virtually all of his off time with. And that summer, he did just that. He went out with his friends, they explored all of Ohio and outside surrounding areas. They spent a lot of time outside and they enjoyed each other's company. Towards the end of the summer, James and his friends knew it was time to schedule their annual trip to Cedar Point. Cedar Point is an amusement park about two hours northwest of East Canton, Ohio. It's situated right on the shores of Lake Erie and it's known for its incredible roller coasters, of which they had 17, making them the park with the second most roller coasters in the world. Every summer, since James could remember, he and his very close friends would make a trip out to Cedar Point, usually at the end of the summer, to kind of cap off their vacation. After looking at their calendar, they decided that the best day to go would be Thursday, August 13th. This would give the group of friends one more fun thing to do before the following week James started his new job. So on the morning of that Thursday, the friends piled into a car and they made the two hour commute up to Cedar Point. And as soon as they got there, they went inside, they grabbed a map and they began systematically hitting as many rides as they possibly could. And so by 4.30 PM, they were totally exhausted. They'd been on virtually every ride. And so they were about to call it a day when James and his friends decide, hey, let's go on one more ride before we pack it in. And so they pull out their map and they're looking and they realize they haven't gone on one of their favorite rides. It was called the Raptor. The Raptor was not Cedar Point's biggest roller coaster but it was their fastest. It would reach a top speed of 57 miles per hour. Passengers are seated four across with their feet dangling below them in these suspended chairs with the big harness that comes down. And then once the ride starts, they're brought slowly up this 137 foot hill. And then at the top, they pause before being dropped down into this nearly 4,000 foot long track that spins them upside down six different times. So James and his friends, they closed up their map and they ran their way over to the Raptor. They got in line and by 4.50 PM, they had made it to the front of the line. They got into their seats, their harness came down and then the ride started and they were pulled up to the top of the hill. They paused and then they were launched down the track. And for two minutes, they zipped and zagged and loop de looped all through this track. And then it was just suddenly over and the friends had a great time on the ride, except James realized about halfway through the ride when they were upside down, his phone and wallet had come out of his pockets and he actually saw them fall down towards the ground. And although he didn't see exactly where they landed, he had a pretty good idea of where they were. And so after they got off the ride, the friends were kind of talking about how much fun it was. And James said to them, hey, I lost my cell phone and wallet. Will you guys come with me while I go look for them? And so the friends agreed. They left the Raptor station and they walked down the paved path until they were in front of this fence that said no trespassing. And so James gets up to the fence and he's looking inside of this fenced in area. And he sees right in the middle of this restricted area is his phone and his wallet. And before James's friends could tell him not to do this, he had climbed over the fence and entered into this restricted area. He ran over to his phone and his wallet, he picked it up. And then when he stood back up again, the next wave of Raptor riders came blazing through the area and the underside, the steel underside of the ride hit James right in the back of the head. He never saw it coming. It threw him forward, he landed on his face and immediately the park officials saw this happen. They stopped the ride, but the riders on board the Raptor, they didn't know what was going on and so they're stopped on the ride they're looking down and they hear people screaming and they look down and they see there's this man James lying face down on the ground with blood pooling around his head the fence James had climbed over was there specifically to keep visitors from getting too close to this one low point in the Raptor ride where the ride can come through and it can hit you and so medical workers they rush over they hop over the fence they get to James but it was too late he was pronounced dead at the scene that day Cedar Park was put under investigation for James's death, but after reviewing the footage and talking to witnesses, the investigation was closed and they determined that the park was not at fault. James, despite being a very intelligent and sensible man, had a brief lapse in judgment and it unfortunately cost him his life. Today, Cedar Park is still open for business and the Raptor ride is still operational. On August 14th, 2012, Celestino Cervantes picked up 28-year-old Victor Diaz for work. 
Celestino was an expert roofer and he had just hired Victor to come on his crew and help him with a particular job. This was going to be Victor's first day as a roofer, but for the past 10 years he had worked in construction, so he was familiar with the operation. The two men arrived at their job site in San Antonio, Texas around 8 a.m. that morning. They were in charge of putting a new roof on a 115 year old building that was being redeveloped into a fancy steakhouse. Until 2001, this building had been used by a brewing company to house their enormous boilers. As such, this building was referred to as the boiler house. Protruding from the boiler house roof was this large metal duct that was 15 feet long and almost looked like a covered walkway, and it connected to the side of this huge smokestack. This duct and smokestack used to be how the built-up condensation inside the boiler house was able to travel up and out of the building. When the two roofers got out of their truck, Celestino told Victor to take his tools and make his way up to the roof of the boiler house and get to work and that he had a few things he had to do down on the ground floor, but he would be up to check on him in a little bit. Celestino turned around and was fiddling with his equipment inside of the truck while Victor made his way into the building and out of sight. An hour and a half later, Celestino went up to the roof to check on Victor, but he couldn't find Victor anywhere and he couldn't find his tools anywhere. So Celestino went back down into the main section of this building where other contractors that were working on this renovation were, and he began asking them, hey, have you seen this guy, Victor? He works with me, I can't find him, and no one had seen him. And so Celestino is thinking to himself, well, I guess Victor must have left, but that didn't really make any sense because Victor didn't have a vehicle and he didn't live nearby. But Celestino is thinking, you know what, maybe somebody came and picked him up. Now, unfortunately, Victor did not carry a cell phone, so nobody had any way of getting directly in contact with him. So Celestino leaves the building and he calls Victor's brother and he asks him, you know, have you seen Victor? Do you know where he might have gone? And Victor's brother says, no, I haven't seen him since this morning when he left with you. So Victor's brother began calling around to friends and family and asked them if they had seen Victor, but nobody knew where he was. So for the rest of the day, Celestino and the rest of Victor's friends and family, they went out looking for Victor at the job site and around the surrounding areas, but there was just no sign of him. And so that night, Victor's brother went to the police to file a missing person report. But the police told him that it was really too early to file a report because Victor was an adult and there was no sign of foul play and that he should just come back in a day or two if Victor still has not shown up. Two days go by and Victor had still not shown up. So Victor's sister-in-law went back to the police and says, okay, now I wanna file a missing person report. We don't know where he is. No one can get in touch with him. We need your help. But the officer she spoke to told her that she still needed to wait another five days to process this request. It would turn out this was just not true. It was a mistake. There was no arbitrary waiting period to file a missing person report. So without any help from the police, Victor's friends and family and coworkers spent the next several days scouring San Antonio, scouring the job site, looking everywhere for him and handing out flyers and asking people if they'd seen him, but no one had, he had just disappeared. By Monday the following week, so six days after Victor has gone missing, his family had printed out dozens of these huge posters with his face on them and a number to call if you had any information about him. And their plan was to distribute them the following morning all over San Antonio. But the following morning, before they headed out, they got a call. Victor had been found. Seven days earlier, when Celestino told Victor to head inside and make his way to the roof and begin the project, Victor had gotten his tools, gone inside, he made his way up the stairwell to the second floor, and then he made a series of odd decisions. Instead of making his way to the access door and climbing his way up to the roof, he went to the far side of the second floor where there were all these wooden barriers preventing people from going any farther. He climbed over all these barriers and he reached the entrance to that huge duct where the con condensation used to go. And so from his perspective, he would have been looking into this duct and it would have been completely pitch black because it connected to that smokestack and the smokestack was totally sealed off. But despite not having any idea where this tunnel goes and it clearly not being the place Celestino told him to go, Victor decides to just get into this tunnel, which required bending over because it was only four feet tall and five feet wide. So he gets inside of this tunnel and he begins shuffling his way deeper and deeper into this tunnel until he reaches the end of the tunnel where it actually connects into the smokestack. Now at the top of this duct where it connects to the smokestack, there wasn't a grate or bars or any sort of barrier that would stop you from spilling into the smokestack. And because it was totally pitch black, Victor, when he made it to the edge of that duct, he just kept on walking and fell 20 feet down to the bottom of the smokestack. And so in total darkness, Victor, who was probably badly hurt from the fall, began feeling around the inside of the chimney, looking for 
for a way out, and he eventually found a hatch that was big enough for him to fit through, but when he felt up against it, he realized it was locked from the outside and it wouldn't even budge. He couldn't even get light to come in through a crack. It was totally sealed off. And that was the only way out of the smokestack unless he could get back up to the duct, but there was no way to do that. He most likely began screaming for help, but he was encased in thick brick, and so his sound wouldn't have traveled. It would have been completely muffled. Plus, the smokestack was fairly far away from the job site, which was very noisy as it is, and so there was just no way they could have heard him, and the smokestack and the duct were not part of the renovation, and so there was absolutely no foot traffic over around the smokestack. He was completely alone, no one knew he was there, and there was no way out. Seven days after Victor fell into the smokestack, workers over at the job site, they noticed this huge swarm of flies over around the base of the smokestack. There were so many flies over there, they decided they had to go investigate. And so as they walked closer and closer to the smokestack, they were hit with this overwhelming stench of death and decay. And then when they got to the smokestack, they could see the flies were centralized on that hatch at the bottom. And so they cut the lock, they opened it up, and inside they found Victor's body and they saw his hands were badly bloodied and bruised, and they were pressed up against the inside of the hatch, indicating in his final moments, he was desperately trying to open that hatch and save himself, but there was just no way to do that. Although no one knows this for sure, it's believed Victor confused the condensation duct with the access point to the roof. If you got something out of today's video and you haven't done this already, please replace the like button's hairspray with Gorilla Glue adhesive spray. On the night of October 25th, 2009, a fit, healthy 30-year-old man named Alex was at home in San Diego watching TV in bed. At some point, he noticed there was a slight pain in his left Achilles tendon. A tendon is the fibrous connective tissue that connects muscle to bone, and the Achilles tendon is the biggest tendon in your whole body, and it's the one you can feel on the back of your ankle. It connects your calf muscle to your heel. Alex had never had tendon pain before, and so he assumed it must just be tightness from the long walk he had taken that night around his neighborhood. And so after massaging it for a little while, eventually he kind of forgot about it and just kept watching TV until he fell asleep for the night. The next morning when Alex woke up, he immediately recognized that the pain in his left Achilles tendon was 10 times worse. It was blindingly painful. And then his right Achilles tendon was also now starting to hurt. And so he reflexively reached under the covers and tried to massage his sore tendons. But as soon as he touched the backs of his legs, he felt shooting pain in that area and so he couldn't touch them anymore and so instead he swung his legs off the bed and he sat up on the edge of his bed and then he slowly rocked forward until he transferred his weight onto his feet and tried to stand up and as soon as he did he fell to the ground because of the blinding pain in his tendons and so he manages to pull himself back up using the bed and then he hobbles his way out of his bedroom over to the top of the stairs and then he grabs the railing and he carefully makes his way down the stairs and as he's walking it feels like the tendons are so tight they're gonna snap like a rubber band and so he gets to the bottom of the stairs and he walks his way around into the kitchen where he sits down and he kind of evaluates what's going on and he thinks to himself man I must be developing a wicked case of tendonitis tendonitis is inflammation or irritation of the tendon and so Alex grabbed his laptop which was right in front of him he opened it up and he began looking for ways to alleviate pain from tendonitis and so after looking at a couple medical forums he got up and hobbled his way over to the bathroom he opened up the medicine cabinet and he grabbed the Icy Hot, which is a topical pain reliever. And then he hobbled his way into the first floor living room where he laid down on the couch. And then he applied a healthy amount of Icy Hot on the backs of both of his legs right over his tendons. And then he propped his legs up on two pillows. And so he laid there and he's thinking, okay, so it's the weekend, I have today off. I'll just lay here until the pain subsides. But by that evening, the pain had not subsided. It had gotten progressively worse. And so Alex picked up the phone and he called a podiatrist, which is a doctor who specializes in feet and the lower half of your leg. And he made an appointment
appointment for the following morning to have a look at his Achilles tendons. And so after he hung up, Alex thought to himself, you know, the best thing I can do is probably just go to bed. I'm bound to feel better in the morning. And so Alex hobbles his way back up the stairs, holding onto the railing, and he goes into his bathroom to wash his face. He reaches for the towel and he notices his thumb is suddenly locked up and he can't move his thumb. And then his other thumb too locks up and he's looking at them and he can't get them to move. And so with his other fingers, he tries to move that thumb and bend that thumb, but he can't do it. The tendon in both of his thumbs had suddenly become unbelievably tight to the point where he couldn't move his thumbs anymore. Up until this point, Point, Alex had convinced himself that whatever was happening with his Achilles tendons was probably minor. That with or without medical intervention, it was bound to just get better. But now he wasn't so sure because the thumb situation, that really scared him. He had never experienced anything like that and he couldn't help but think that whatever was happening in his thumbs was probably what was happening in his Achilles, making this a much more complex problem. So Alex forgets about washing his face or even going to bed and instead leaves the bathroom and grabs the railing and hobbles back downstairs. He makes his way into the kitchen with the stiff thumbs and he sits down at the table. He opens up his laptop and he begins looking for any information about what is happening to him. A few minutes into his search, he was about to type something into Google when all of a sudden he felt the rest of his fingers start to lock up. The tendons in his fingers were tightening up just like his thumbs and just like his Achilles tendons. And so now Alex is going into crisis mode. He doesn't know what's happening to him. He has no idea what to do, but but he manages to calm himself down and he told himself, Alex, tomorrow you got a doctor's appointment. They'll know what's wrong with you. They will fix this. Everything's gonna be just fine. And so despite his overwhelming urge to panic, he closes his laptop and he hobbles his way over to the stairs. He climbs up to the second floor and he goes directly into his bedroom, crawls in bed, and he goes to sleep. The next morning when he woke up, the tightness and pain in his Achilles tendons and in his hands had not gotten any worse. And that kind of comforted Alex. He's thinking, okay, we're past the worst of this. I just need to figure out what this is and then fix it. And so he crawled out of bed, he hobbled his way over to the stairs, he went down, he grabbed a quick bite to eat, and then he went outside to his car to head out to his doctor's appointment. When he got to his car, he reached for the door handle and when he pulled on it, he felt an unbelievable surge of pain in the hand that was on the car. And when he looked down, all of the joints in that hand that had been pulling on the car, they had all separated. Like the connective tissue that kept his finger whole was no longer strong enough. So Alex screamed and he retracted his hand in horror. And when he looked at it, the joints had gone back to normal, but the pain in this hand persisted. And so on adrenaline alone, Alex managed to use his other hand and got the car door open. He went inside and then he could barely grip the steering wheel because one hand is now wrecked and his other hand is not much better, but he managed to speed to the doctor's office. And then when he got inside, he could barely fill out the paperwork because one hand was wrecked and the other wasn't much better. So he couldn't grip the pen. But after he gave them his paperwork, the doctor finally came out and they brought him back to an exam room. And that's when Alex explained that originally it was just his Achilles tendons. That's why he had called for this appointment. But after making that appointment, not only had the pain in his Achilles gotten much, much worse, but there was also now pain and tightness in his hands, including one hand that had just fallen apart when he tried to open a door. Alex told the doctor that he had never experienced anything even remotely resembling this in his entire life. He led a very healthy lifestyle and really had no idea what could be causing this. Although he did say 10 days prior, he had finished a round of antibiotics. The drug was called Cipro, but previously he had used used this drug with no issues. But as a precaution, he told the doctor because he knew one of the side effects of this drug was tendon problems. And so as a precaution, Alex had actually brought the paperwork for that drug, Cipro, and he gave it to the doctor. And so the doctor, after hearing the story, he reads through the fact sheet of this drug and he tells Alex that he doesn't think it's a side effect of the drug. He thinks Alex is showing all the signs of having an autoimmune disease like lupus or multiple sclerosis and that he needs to go to a rheumatologist and get tested for that. And so Alex is horrified by this. He can't believe that only a couple of days ago he was totally normal and now it felt like his whole life was falling apart. And so he left that appointment, he went out to his car and he called a rheumatologist and he set up an appointment for a couple of days later to get tested and then he went home. And over the next couple of days, as he waited for that next appointment, his condition only got worse. Every muscle, joint, and connective tissue in his body was either extremely tight or hurt or both. 
By the time he made it to the rheumatologist's office, he could barely move on his own. After the doctor had run several tests on Alex, Alex began mentally preparing himself to be told that he had an autoimmune disease. He believed at this point that that was the most logical explanation for what was happening to him. But when the test results came back in, to Alex's shock, he was negative across the board. He did not have an autoimmune disease. And so Alex hobbled out of the office, he got out to his car, he sat down, and he was in pain and at a loss. He had no idea what was happening to his body, and it seemed like none of the experts knew either. And so when Alex got back to his house, he made his way into the kitchen and he sat down to do some more research, but he felt like he was at a loss there too. He didn't even know what to research. He had searched for every possible combination of pain, tightness in your Achilles, pain, tightness in your hands and your fingers, and nothing was lining up with his experience. And so he thought to himself, you know, even though that podiatrist ruled out the antibiotic he had taken a cycle of before he started feeling the way he was feeling, even though he ruled that out, I might as well do some more research on it because it's the one thing I can point to that was newly introduced to my life before I had all these things happen to me. And so he opened up his laptop and he typed in Cipro side effects and what he discovered horrified him. Cipro is part of a class of antibiotics called fluoroquinolones, and while it is a very effective antibiotic, it comes with extremely severe side effects. And enough people who have taken a fluoroquinolone have suffered from these side effects that there's actually a term given to them. They are said to have been floxed. And as Alex discovered in his research, there are many online communities for these floxed individuals, many of which used to be healthy and fit, but after taking these drugs, they became bedridden or had to transition to a wheelchair. This is due to one of the nastiest side effects of this class of drug ruptured tendons. As a reminder, a tendon connects muscle to bone. And so if you were to say a tendon has ruptured, what you're actually saying is the muscle has torn off of the bone. And apparently this is unbelievably painful and almost always requires surgery to fix. And in many of these floxing cases, the fluoroquinolone drugs cause these people's tendons to start dramatically tightening until they just start rupturing. And there's nothing they can do to stop it unless they stop moving hence becoming bedridden and transitioning to wheelchairs. When Alex read all these horrible testimonials of people who had been floxed, he realized their experience mimicked his own. He was floxed. But once he knew what he was up against, he began looking for a timeline. How long would he have these symptoms for? And what he saw was most people experience these awful symptoms for about three months and then they fade away. So for three months, Alex suffered, but he stayed positive. He was certain he was going to get better. But three months came and went and he didn't get better. In fact, he got worse. All of his tendons continued to tighten and some of them ruptured and he had to quit his job and had to move in with his parents, but he stayed positive. He went back online and he began reading about more severe floxing cases and he saw those people typically saw a big turnaround at the three year mark. And while that was overwhelming and awful and disheartening, he at least had something to look at as the light at the end of the tunnel. And so for three more years, he waited and waited in pain, he eventually became completely bedridden and completely dependent on his parents. But then the three year mark came and went and much like the three month mark, nothing got better, he just got worse. And that was when Alex realized he was in the range of people that suffered from their floxing permanently. In 2016, so seven years after taking that fateful dose of Cipro, he wrote a blog post on his website updating the world about his condition. In it, he says he's only gotten worse and that his life effectively came to an end in 2009 when over a six day period, he swallowed those 12 Cipro pills. And so now all he looks forward to is his death. If you got something out of today's video and you haven't done this already, please gift the like button one of those magic eight balls that tells the future, except replace all of the potential answers with reply hazy, try again.
In May of 2011, 27-year-old Mikalina Lewandowska was surprised when she got a text message from her on-again, off-again boyfriend, 27-year-old Marcin Kasprzak. The pair had actually previously been engaged and had a three-year-old son together, but they just could never seem to make it work for longer than a couple of months at a time. In the text message, Marcin was asking Mikalina if he could take her shopping, something he knew she liked to do. As for Mikalina, lately she had been turning down requests like this one from Marcin, and she was in inclined to at first, but their son was already being looked after by her mother and Michalina didn't have plans that day. And so she thought, you know what, what the heck? And so she said, yes. So Michalina took a shower and got ready and even put on her engagement ring that Marcin had given her. And then she waited by the door. A little while later, Marcin, who was an aspiring bodybuilder who had become addicted to taking steroids, showed up at her Huddersfield, England home. Michalina opened the door, Marcin came inside. And then as soon as the door shut behind him, he tased Michalina, he jumped on top of her, and then he bound and gagged her. And then once she was restrained on the ground with no idea what was going on, Marcin opened the front door and waved down to his car that was parked on the curb. And one of his friends, this 18 year old named Patrick, came out and walked up to the house and came inside. And then Patrick and Marcin worked together to cram Michalina into this small, rugged cardboard box. And then once she was forced inside of there, they closed it up, taped it shut, and then brought the box down to the front of the house and put it into Marcin's trunk. And then Marcin and Patrick hopped in the front two seats of the car and drove off. Once they reached the outskirts of town, they parked in a parking lot right next to this huge forest. And from there, they took the box with Michalina inside of it and two shovels and walked into the woods. And at some point they left the path and walked way away from where anybody would normally be until they felt like they were far enough away that no one would see them. And at that point, they put Michalina down and then using their shovels, they dug a grave. Once it was deep enough, they put Michalina in her box inside of the grave and then they covered her back up with dirt and then put a 90 pound log on top of her and then the two of them just walked away leaving Michalina to die. In the box Michalina was not dead yet but she knew if she attempted to escape with Marcin and Patrick right above her they would just kill her on the spot or they would dig an even deeper hole and then it would be impossible to get out again. And so after waiting an agonizingly long amount of time to ensure Marcin and Patrick had gone Michalina jumped into action. She immediately tried to wriggle her way out of her restraints, but the position they had forced her into, which was basically the fetal position with her hands tied behind her back, it didn't allow her to move very much in any one direction. And so without any movement, she could not get herself to come free of these restraints. And so as she's struggling, trying to figure out what she's going to do, she realizes she had chosen to wear her engagement ring that Marcin had given her, something she never wore anymore, and she could potentially use the diamonds in the ring to cut through the tape that was keeping her wrists tied together. And so she began working that ring until finally she did cut through her restraints and her hands were free. And so she managed to force both of her arms right in front of her body. And then once they were in front of her, she immediately began scratching and clawing at the cardboard right above her. And eventually she scratched a hole in the box itself and dirt began pouring in on her. And she was already very low on oxygen. She was fighting off unconsciousness by remembering that her three-year-old son needed her and she had no idea what Marcin was going to do to him. And so she just kept on digging and fighting as the dirt's coming in on her and she's struggling to breathe. And then finally she pokes all the way through and she can see sunlight and fresh air comes into the hole. She can breathe again. And then with this huge surge of adrenaline, she forces herself and manages to push all the way up through this hole until she's standing in her grave. And from there, she pulls herself up and out of the dirt and she runs towards the road where she flags down a motorist and the motorist would call police and then wait with her until they arrived. After Marcin was arrested, the story came out that he had heard a rumor that Michalina was going to be leaving him and going back to Poland with their son, and he didn't want that, so he had decided he was going to kill her. Marcin was found guilty of attempted murder and sentenced to 20 years in prison, and Patrick was found guilty of kidnapping and sentenced to four and a half years in prison. In 1932, Charlie Pollard was a 26-year-old farmer living in Macon County, Alabama, where 82% of the population at the time was African American, and they were all forced to live under the rules of a strictly segregated society. At the time, the United States was just beginning to crawl out of the Great Depression that had started three years earlier, but you wouldn't know it riding through Charlie's town. 
Like Charlie, many of the other residents in Macon County were completely dirt poor, and they lived in these wooden shacks with no screens on their windows, there was no furniture inside, and they would just throw some dirty rags on the ground to sleep on. On average, the men in the town that were lucky enough to have a job made less than $1 per day. So when Charlie heard a rumor that the government was going to be coming to town and giving free medical exams to all the African American men, Charlie was thrilled. He had never been to a doctor before, and he certainly wasn't going to turn down a free visit to one. And so a couple of days later, the rumor turned out to be true when a government health service worker showed up in their town and set up shop in their one-room schoolhouse. Charlie got in line with the hundreds of other men from Macon County, and then by mid-morning, it was his turn, and the health service worker told him that today they were just going to be doing a blood test. And so Charlie eagerly rolled up his sleeve and stuck his arm out. A couple of days later, the results from the blood test had come in, and Charlie was informed that he had bad blood. Bad blood was a commonly used term in that area at the time to describe a wide array of ailments. The worker didn't get into specifics about what Charlie's diagnosis meant. They just told him that in virtue of his diagnosis of bad blood, he was now eligible to join a government-sponsored medical treatment program. If he agreed to be a part of it, he would not only receive medical care for his bad blood, he would also receive free rides to and from the health clinic, he would get a free hot meal on examination days, and in the event he died, during the program, his family would be given $50 if they allowed the doctors to perform a thorough autopsy on his body before they buried him. Despite not really understanding what it meant to have bad blood, Charlie decided to join the program, mostly because of those free meals and because he had a deep trust and respect of the government. And Charlie wasn't alone. About 400 other African-American men from Macon County agreed to be a part of the program as well. At first, the program was everything they promised it would be. It was just a couple of low-key medical examinations with a nice hot meal, and then occasionally they would take some pills and have another blood draw. But eventually, they started being given regular, excruciatingly painful spinal taps that would leave them bedridden for weeks afterwards. But despite this painful and surprising turn of events that none of the men saw coming, they were not aware they would be getting spinal taps as part of this program, Charlie and the other men were convinced this program was still in their best interest and that they could trust the government to eventually cure them of their bad blood. And so Charlie and the other men didn't resist these spinal taps or other follow-on painful and bizarre medical procedures that they were being told was good for them and would help them get rid of this bad blood. Less than a year later, men in this program began getting sick. They started developing rashes and sores all over their body. Their bones and joints would ache. They began losing hair. They had indigestion. They had headaches. They had constant fevers. And for some of the men, these symptoms would eventually subside. But for others, they got dramatically worse. For those men, they would develop tumors and their bones would start to disintegrate. They would go blind or deaf or become paralyzed or they would simply die. But despite the obvious ineffectiveness of this treatment program, it persisted. When America entered World War II in 1941, Charlie and many of the other men in this program wanted to enlist in the military and go join the fight. But when they went to enlist, they were told that as members of the special medical program, they could only receive treatment from the doctors in that program. And so they could not receive treatment from military doctors and therefore were disqualified from military service. While frustrated by this rule, Charlie and many of the other men still considered themselves to be very fortunate to be allowed to be a part of this program that was curing them of their bad blood. And Charlie specifically felt like he was one of the luckiest men inside of this program because his bad blood had not led to these terrible symptoms that his friends were experiencing. And so over the years, in between his medical appointments, Charlie got married, he had a child, he even managed to buy a little plot of land that he farmed on nearly year round. Then in 1973, so over 40 years after they began this medical program, Charlie Charlie and the other survivors of this program had their lives completely turned upside down. That year, a very junior assistant within the public health service secretly mailed off all of the records of this Macon County medical program to the Associated Press. And then a couple of days later, the Washington Star newspaper ran this huge story on their front page that said syphilis victims in United States study went untreated for 40 years. It would turn out Charlie and the other 400 men in this medical program, they didn't have bad blood. That was just kind of a made up term to get them not to ask any questions. What they had was syphilis, a deadly disease that ravages the human body in three stages that can unfold over a lifetime. And so these doctors, 
that treated Charlie were not actually treating him. They knew he had syphilis. That was why he was even part of the program to begin with. When they tested his blood, they were trying to see who had syphilis in Macon County. And then they took those people and they entered them into this phony program, not to make them better, because this was not a treatment program. It was a US government backed medical study of what happens to African American men with syphilis if their condition goes completely untreated for their entire lives. The leaders of the study did not care what happened to these men. And that point was made crystal clear when in the 1940s, a cure for syphilis was discovered, penicillin. But instead of giving it to these men and saving their lives, they intentionally hid the cure from them and prevented them from getting it. This is why these men were not allowed to enlist in the military or seek outside medical care because those doctors would discover these men had syphilis and they would just give them penicillin, curing them, but that screwed up the study and so they couldn't have that. The Public Health Service chose Macon County, Alabama, because at the time, 35% of the population was already infected with syphilis. And because they knew the men in this town would be largely uneducated and poor and desperate, and therefore easy to trick into joining this highly unethical study. At least 28 men in the study died as a result of their syphilis infections, and countless others suffered from long-term side effects. Charlie was 66 years old when he heard the news. Finally, he had an answer, bad blood, meant he had syphilis, but fortunately his syphilis had either burned out or gone dormant. But he thought about all the other men in the study that had not been as lucky, and Charlie felt so betrayed by the government. He and the rest of the men had no idea they were getting taken advantage of. Charlie got in touch with a lawyer who eventually sued the federal government, and in an out-of-court settlement, Charlie and the other 73 survivors of the so-called Tuskegee experiment were given $38,000 each as compensation. After the settlement, Charlie just went back to his simple life in Macon County. And then 27 years later, on April 29th, 2000, Charlie passed away at the age of 94. In the early morning hours of March 11th, 1989, four young men who were all in their 20s and all very close friends left their homes in East Texas and headed south. Nine hours later, they arrived in the beautiful resort town of South Padre Island, which is just off the coast of Southern Texas. They were there to enjoy their spring break by sunning on the beach, drinking in bars, and meeting girls. When they finally arrived that night, they were so exhausted from the trip that they went right to bed. The next morning when they got up, they went straight down to the beach and they had some drinks. And then by the afternoon, they were talking amongst themselves and they decided that for their first full night of being on vacation, they would kick things off with a bang and they would go into Mexico and party there. And so so they piled into their car and they drove an hour southwest to Brownsville, Texas, which is a town that sits right on the border of Mexico. And when they got there, they parked their car and then walked right over the footbridge that crossed the Rio Grande River into Mexico. On the other side, in Mexico, they found themselves in the town of Matamoros, which is very popular amongst spring break goers for their bars and their clubs. And so the four friends got a quick bite to eat at a hamburger joint, and then they made their way into the bars and the clubs, and they danced and they drank for hours. And then at some point, they got tired and left the bar scene. They crossed over the footbridge back into the U.S. and made their way back to their hotel in South Padre Island. The next morning when they got up and they recovered from their hangover, they decided they had so much fun in Matamoros the night before that they had to go back. And so that night they piled back into their car, they drove back down to Brownsville, Texas, they crossed over that footbridge into Mexico, and then all night they partied and danced and had a great time. And then at some point, the four decided it was time to leave, and so they left their bar and began walking towards the footbridge. But that night, it was so crowded in Matamoros that you could barely move a foot without bumping into someone. And so the foursome split into two separate pairs. And the lead pair, they made their way ahead, and they stopped at the gift shop right at the foot of that bridge going back to the U.S. side. And there they waited for the trail pair. The trail pair, which consisted of Mark Kilroy and Bill Huddleston, they weren't far behind, but they got sidetracked when Mark saw a girl standing next to a house that he had seen earlier in the night, and he just wanted to go up and talk to her and say bye to her. And so they go over to this girl, and while Mark is talking to her, Bill moves on ahead and goes down an alleyway to urinate, and then when he comes back out, Mark and this girl are not there. Bill assumed Mark must have just moved on the little ways up to the bridge where the other two friends were at the gift shop, and so after looking around for just a couple of seconds, Bill makes his way up to the bridge and he meets up with the other two friends. And when he gets there, he asks the other two friends, you know, where's Mark? Did he come up here already? And they say, no, we haven't seen him. 
And so now the trio is a little bit concerned, but they're thinking, okay, he must be with this girl he had seen. And so they backtracked a little ways and they looked for Mark. They went back to where he had been talking to that girl. And again, he wasn't there. And so they decided, okay, he must have already crossed the bridge and made it to our car. And he's probably just waiting for us over there. And so the trio crosses over the bridge into the US side. They get to their car and Mark's not there. And so at this point, they are pretty concerned about Mark, but they eventually convince themselves that he must have just left with this girl and they probably are back at the hotel together. And so after a little while, the trio decides, let's just go back to the hotel. We're bound to find Mark. And so they drive all the way back to South Padre Island. They get to their hotel room and Mark's not there. But again, they tell themselves he's not here because he's probably with this girl in another room. And so they don't worry about him. They go to bed. But the next morning, when Mark still had not come back to the hotel room, they decide, you know what, something's wrong here, we have to tell police. And so they file a missing person report, but the police get so many of these about spring breakers who go missing in Matamoros that they don't really take them seriously at first, because typically the missing person will just show up 24 hours later with a horrible hangover and no memory of how they got back from Matamoros. And so the police were expecting this to happen with Mark, but after 24 hours, when Mark didn't show up with a bad hangover, they were convinced that something had happened to him. And American and Mexican police suspected foul play because Matamoros and the surrounding areas are not exactly safe for tourists, but they didn't have any leads, and so Mark's case languished. Three weeks later, a drug smuggler drove through a police checkpoint without stopping just outside of Matamoros. And so the police pursued him and this guy ultimately stopped at this secluded ranch up in the mountains. After the police arrested the smuggler, they noticed a ranch worker was standing nearby and on a whim, they showed him a picture of Mark and said, hey, have you seen this guy? And the worker, despite being scared and not really sure what to do, he said to police, yeah, I have seen him here. The smuggler and his friends, they brought him here in handcuffs. And then the worker turned around and pointed up the mountain towards the shack that was about 400 yards up the mountain. And he said, that's where they took him. And so authorities began walking up the hillside towards the shack. And when they got about 100 yards away, they saw this big metal cauldron sitting on the front stoop of the shack. And then when they got about 50 yards away, they were hit with this horrible smell of death and decay. And then when they got right up in front of the shack and could see inside of this cauldron and inside of the shack itself, what they saw was so gruesome and horrible that even the most senior and grizzled responding officers were totally shaken up by it. Under intense questioning, the drug smuggler that had originally led police up to the secluded ranch and the shack admitted that he was a part of a gang and that his gang had taken Mark. Three weeks earlier, while Bill was urinating in that alleyway, Mark spoke to that girl he wanted to see and then she went off and then Mark was left standing alone waiting for Bill to come back. And while he was waiting, a man on the street parked in a red truck yelled out to him to come over. He needed help or something. He lured him to the truck. And so Mark went over to the truck and then right when he asked the man, you know, what do you need? Two men, one of which included this drug smuggler, jumped out from behind a building and tried to grab Mark and put him inside of this red truck. Mark was a very fit, big athletic guy, and so he was able to fight the two men off and then took off running down the road. But he only made it about two blocks when another car full of gangsters showed up, cut him off, and then at gunpoint got him to come into the second vehicle. And so once he was restrained inside of this vehicle, they drove him out of the town of Matamoros onto some backcountry roads up into the mountains to this secluded ranch where they left him overnight in the car. The next morning, the gang members came back out and they wrapped duct tape around Mark's mouth and his whole face and his eyes. They just left a little slit around his nostrils so he could breathe and then they pulled him out of the vehicle with his hands tied behind his back and they walked him up the hill to that shack. This gang that had abducted Mark that this drug smuggler was a part of was more like a cult and this cult was led by a man named Constanzo who practiced a form of black magic called Palo. Constanzo would perform Palo rituals, which he claimed to his followers would make he and all of them invincible. These rituals, which took place in the shack up in the mountains, involved human sacrifice. Constanzo would tell his followers that these people who were going to be sacrificed, they didn't just need to die, they needed to die screaming. Because Constanzo believed the more agony he inflicted on his victims before they ultimately died and were sacrificed to the gods, the more power the gods would grant to he and his followers. And so the people who got kidnapped and marched up to that shack to be sacrificed were subjected to unspeakable atrocities. And Mark had been selected to be the next rich 
ritual sacrifice. After Mark was led out of the vehicle with his face all taped up, he was walked up to that shack where he spent several horrifying hours with Constanzo and his cronies, and then at some point Mark was killed when a machete was brought down on the back of his neck. Afterwards, Mark's brain was removed and placed into their sacred cauldron and boiled, and then Mark's legs were removed, and then a long wire was inserted into Mark's torso and fished around inside of him until they hooked it onto his spinal column, and then they buried his torso and his legs, and they left that wire protruding from his body up out of the dirt. There was basically a lead poking out of the ground, and the reason they did that was because later on they could just pull on that wire and pull up Mark's bones and use his bones to make jewelry. Mark's body was one of 15 discovered in and around this shack. The total number of people that Constanzo and his cult ritualistically murdered is at least 16, but believed to be closer to 26. However, the police were not able to get the official number from Constanzo because Constanzo had his followers shoot and kill him before the police could get to him. Five other cult members were ultimately convicted for their roles in the cult's murders, and they were each given a sentence of over 60 years in prison. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, please give the like button a metal tin of delicious Danish butter cookies and tell them it's your way of apologizing for all the mistreatment over the past year, but be sure to replace the cookies with anthrax before you hand it over. In 2009, Rebecca Aylward was a 14-year-old girl living near Bridgend, Wales. She was very close with her mother and her younger siblings, she was a model student, and she was well-liked amongst her peers. That year, she began spending more and more time with a boy in her grade, 14-year-old Josh Davies, who, like her, was a model student and had many friends. In October of that year, Rebecca's mother asked her if Josh was her boyfriend, and she said yes. Even though she knew her daughter was a bit young to be in a serious relationship, she'd spent enough time around Josh to form a very high opinion of him. He was incredibly kind and generous and protective of Rebecca, and so she was happy for the two of them. In January of the following year, Josh was allowed to stay over for the weekend at Rebecca's house, and Rebecca's mother remembers the two of them having such a good time together, goofing around with Rebecca's younger siblings and painting each other's nails. When Josh left at the end of that weekend, he told Rebecca that it had been the best weekend of his life. After he left, Rebecca couldn't stop smiling. She was in love. But later that day, Rebecca received a very surprising text message from Josh. He told her he didn't want to be in a relationship with her anymore. Rebecca was crushed, and she tried to get an answer out of Josh as to why he wanted to break it off, but he didn't give her one, and instead, he began spreading horrible rumors about her at school, and then he went around to all of her friends and told them what a horrible person she was. And so for the rest of that school year, that's how it went. Josh just continued to mercilessly bully Rebecca for no reason. And then behind closed doors, Josh would tell his friends that he not only hated Rebecca, that he wanted to kill Rebecca. But none of his friends took it seriously. In fact, one of his friends even told Josh that if he ever killed Rebecca, he would buy him breakfast. Fast forward to the end of 2010 when the next school year began and Josh's behavior completely changed. Suddenly, he was being nice and caring to Rebecca and showing a genuine interest in her. And Rebecca, even though this guy had abused her for the past better part of a year, she secretly still loved him. And so before long, she allowed him back into her life. About a month later, on the evening of October 22nd, Josh sent Rebecca a Facebook message asking her if she would meet him the following day in the woods near their home. This was a popular hangout spot for teens, and so to Rebecca, this constituted a date. This would be the first official date since their breakup nearly a year ago, and so Rebecca was excited and told him, sure, I'd love to go. And so the next day, Rebecca got up early to put on her makeup and to get ready and get dressed, and then after she was all dolled up, she said bye to her mom and she had headed out to meet up with Josh. Shortly after she left, Rebecca's mom got a bad feeling about this meetup, and so she called her daughter and said, hey, stay on the phone with me until you see Josh. And so the two of them chatted until Rebecca made her way to the edge of the woods. And then she says to her mom, oh, I can see Josh, he's walking towards me. Everything is totally fine. I love you and I'll see you later. After she hung up the phone, Joshua walked up to her, said hello, took her hand and then walked her back into the woods. That morning, Josh had changed his profile picture on Facebook to be an image of the woods where they were having this meeting. And then also that morning, Josh had texted one of his friends and said, you'll be owing me that breakfast soon. And so Josh led Rebecca for quite a while deep into the woods until he came to a stop. 
And while they were stopped, Rebecca at some point turned to look at something, and with her back to Josh, Josh reached down, grabbed a very heavy rock, and proceeded to beat her to death. Afterwards, Josh called his friends to see what they were up to, and they asked him if he was still with Rebecca. And so Josh is standing over this poor girl's lifeless body, and he says to them, define with. Later that day, Josh brought his best friend into the woods and showed him Rebecca's body. And then less than 24 hours later, that friend would tell police what Josh had done. During Josh's trial, he was completely unfazed, completely emotionless, and was seen smiling for much of it. He said he didn't kill Rebecca, and in fact, he tried to place the blame on his best friend, but the jury saw through it, they found him guilty, and he was ultimately sentenced to 14 years in prison. To this day, no one knows for sure why Josh killed Rebecca. The only concrete motive anybody can point to is that one of Josh's friends offered him breakfast if he went through with the killing. Here is a photo of Josh with Rebecca shortly before he killed her. At the start of World War II in 1939, the Kingdom of Yugoslavia did its best to stay neutral and out of the war. But on March 25th, 1941, they finally caved to Nazi pressure and signed a treaty that aligned them with the Nazis. Two days later, Yugoslavian military leaders who were unhappy with this treaty overthrew their government and installed a new king in hopes he would be able to keep their country out of the war. But upon learning of this coup, Hitler issued a directive that classified this new Yugoslavian government as hostile and ordered its invasion. Ten days later, on April 6th, the Nazis invaded Yugoslavia, and then 11 days after that, Yugoslavia surrendered. But despite their speedy victory, the Nazis struggled to maintain control of the country because of local resistance groups that fought them at every turn. One of the primary resistance groups was called the Partisans. Three months after the Nazis' invasion, a 15-year-old girl named Lipa Radic and her family, who all lived in Yugoslavia, were arrested by the Nazis. Three of the men in Lipa's family were members of the Partisans, and so had attracted Nazi attention. 20 days later, as the family still sat in jail wondering what the Nazis were going to do to them, undercover partisans broke into the prison and freed them. After getting back home, Lipa, who was totally inspired by the bravery of these partisan warriors, she immediately joined their group. As a partisan, Lipa would serve as a nurse on the front lines, treating and evacuating the wounded, and then at night, she would participate in direct combat against the Nazis. By 1943, when Lipa was just 17 years old, she had become a very hardened warrior. In February of that year, Lipa was leading a rescue effort of all these women and children, and she was walking them up a mountainside to a partisan camp when the Nazis came out of nowhere and surrounded them on all four sides. And Lipa, who refused to surrender, expended all of her ammunition defending these women and children until she was eventually captured. The Nazis moved Lipa to a nearby village where they viciously interrogated her, demanding that she give up the names and locations of her partisan comrades, but Lipa refused. After three more days of unsuccessfully trying to get Lipa to give up information, the Nazis grew frustrated and sentenced her to death. And so later that day, Lipa was marched out to a tree situated next to a train station and hanging down from one of the branches was a noose, and under the noose was a table. With her hands tied behind her back and only wool socks on her feet, the 17-year-old girl calmly climbed up onto the table and stared down at the crowd. As the noose was being tied around her neck, the Nazi commander gave Lipa one more chance to give up information about her partisan comrades, and if she did that, they would spare her life. The Nazis had brought out a cameraman to document this execution because their plan was they would distribute the pictures all over the country to scare the partisans into submission. That this is what happens if we catch partisans. And so with the cameras flashing away, Lipa famously turned to face this Nazi commander and glared at him and said, those who you're asking about will reveal themselves when they wipe out all of you evildoers to the last man. After this, Lipa was hanged. The pictures of her execution were indeed distributed all around the country, but there was no context or story. It was just some partisan being executed by the Nazis. But eventually, Lipa's story about her defiance and her famous last words found their way into the partisan camp. And suddenly, those images of her execution took on brand new meaning. They no longer inspired fear like the Nazis were hoping. They inspired courage and pride and a will to keep fighting. When the Nazis discovered this is what that picture now represents, 
represented. They tried to destroy all of these pictures, but it was too late. Liba had already become a national hero. Following her death, the partisans continued to fight the Nazis and eventually helped to defeat them. After the war was over, the partisans were recognized as one of the most effective guerrilla forces in the entire war. On December 20th, 1951, Lipa was posthumously awarded the second highest military award in Yugoslavia called the Order of the National Hero. Here is the photo of Lipa glaring at that Nazi commander after she's just told him her comrades are going to kill him. In 2017, Steven Weber was a larger-than-life 38-year-old DJ living in Louisiana. That year, through a mutual friend, he met Kanisha Antoine, who was a 38-year-old lawyer also living in Louisiana. And as soon as they met, they immediately hit it off and began dating. They both had always wanted to travel the world, but they never got around to it because life always seemed to get in the way. But now that they had each other, and so therefore had travel partners, they decided they couldn't wait any longer, and so they created a bucket list of all the places in the world they wanted to go, and then over the next couple of years, they began checking places off their list. In 2019, when Kanisha was going to turn 40, they decided they needed to go somewhere really special to celebrate. And so they checked their bucket list to see where they hadn't gone yet, and they ultimately settled on going to East Africa because there was a resort there they had always wanted to stay in. It was called the Pemba Resort, and it was famous for their underwater room. They literally have a two-story cabin floating 300 meters off the coast. Its main floor is at surface level. It's got a beautiful couch that looks out over the water, and you can take the stairs up to the roof of the main floor where there's another couch and you can stargaze and look out 360 degrees, and there's no other cabins out on the water. You're completely isolated. And then if you go back down to the main floor, there is a ladder that goes straight down 10 meters into the master bedroom, and it's completely underwater. All four walls have these huge windows that look out directly into the beautiful Indian Ocean. To stay in this cabin for one night costs $1,700, and so Stephen and Kanisha decided they would only splurge on it for one night at the end of their Africa trip. So in September of that year, the couple flew out to Africa, and for over a week, they enjoyed sightseeing and going on safaris and eating nice food, and then at the end of their trip, it was time to head out to the underwater room. So they got to the Pemba Resort on the mainland, they checked in, and then they loaded into a boat and were brought out 300 meters to their actual cabin out on the water. And then after the boat left them there, Kanisha got out her phone and began filming. And she filmed as the two walked around and they looked at the amazing view. They went onto the roof and they're looking all around and they're laughing because it's so unbelievably beautiful. And then at some point they make their way down that ladder down into the master bedroom underwater. And the two just can't stop laughing because it was so bizarre and just so incredible being down there. There were fish that were coming up to the glass and just staring at them. They just couldn't believe what they were seeing. And then at some point, Stephen makes a joke that a shark was coming and Kanisha turns around and then sarcastically laughs at him and says, oh, okay, ha ha, yeah, shark. And then she turns off the recording. A little while later, Stephen leaves Kanisha in the master bedroom and he goes upstairs and he puts on fins and then hops in the water. Kanisha, who's still down in the master bedroom, is surprised when she sees her boyfriend on the other side of the glass, out in the Indian Ocean. And so Kanisha just grabs her phone and starts filming him because she knows he's up to something. And then at some point, Stephen pulls out a plastic bag with a handwritten note inside of it, and he presses it up against the glass so she can see what it says. And so Kanisha zooms in on the note, and you can tell from the tone in her voice, she really doesn't know what he's doing, but then there's a pause in the video as she's reading the note. And the note says, I can't hold my breath long enough to tell you everything I love about you, but everything I love about you, I love more and more every day. Will you please be my wife? Marry me. Kanisha is so astounded at this proposal. You can tell she's almost crying. She's so excited. And so as she just continues to film him, Stephen pulls out a ring and he holds it up to the glass. And now at this point, Kanisha is just beside herself. She couldn't be happier. And so Stephen closes the ring box. He grabs the letter and he swims up out of view back to the surface. And Kanisha turns off the recording, turns around, runs to the ladder and climbs up to the main floor to give Stephen her answer that yes, she would marry him. But when she got up there, she looked looked around and Stephen wasn't up there. And so she's yelling for him. She's looking around, waiting for him to show up, but he's not. And so she runs up onto the roof of the main structure to get a better look around to see where he went. But when she got up there, she looked down and there's nothing but ocean. There's no sign of Stephen anywhere. 
And so starting to panic, she runs back down to the main floor at surface level. And now she's frantically yelling for Steven, yelling for him to come up to the surface. Where is he? Where are you? But there's no response. Kanisha is all alone out in this cabin in the middle of the ocean. She has no way to contact anyone on the mainland. And so she has no idea what to do. She doesn't know if she should just jump in the water to go looking for him. She doesn't know if he's maybe playing a joke on her. She just doesn't know what's happening. And so she just reflexively begins screaming out for help, hoping that somebody will hear her and come help her find Steven. And after a little while, some boaters not too far away hear her yelling out for help. They come over and they, along with Kanisha, begin looking and they ultimately find Steven. But by the time they found him, it was too late. He had drowned. The details of exactly how he managed to drown or exactly where he was when they found him are not listed online. Here are the final photos of Stephen Weber. If you got something out of today's video and you haven't done this already, please hold the door for the like button, but open it way too early so the like button has to do a long walk run up to the door just to be polite.